unlike uh, the last guy, I'm not afraid to just show you my password, I guess. Um, of course. So I'm just going to copy it over there. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to be that was. Um, so really, I just use my mobile phone to authenticate to my system. Um, the point here is that uh, how do you how do you make UBP and Android become friends? Is basically the point of this talk. So I'm David Weinstein, I'm a mobile security engineer at uh, Via Forensics, um, and my talk is stronger identity protecting the mobile devices. <coughs> so how did this talk really come about? Well, Andre Valenko, um, who's who's spoken at uh, PasswordsCon before, he actually uh, mentioned you guys to me. I hadn't um, been to any of these conferences before. And basically said that some of the work, the research I've been doing in turning a mobile device into a, an attack uh, system, attack platform, um, whereby I was turning the phone into a, into a remote keyboard, um, would be interesting, and it could be used to basically improve the state of password management on uh, in, in this space. So some of the goals um, of this, the goal of this talk is basically to make strong passwords uh, available to your mortals. Um, I'll look at some of the existing solutions that people generally use. How many of you guys use a, um, a software or password manager? Um, and how about how does it work on your mobile devices? I guess, or do you run it on your mobile devices? And also, yeah, okay. So cool. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Unfortunately, I don't solve the problem of how do you authenticate to a mobile device, but I do help the the um, problem as far as authenticating to other devices. So big problem, right? Um, Strong passwords this seems to be um, counter to usability. Uh, it's hard to remember long and complex passwords, and users are generally terrible. Uh, so Andre uh, basically said that if you could do any one of the, those five, um, you're probably doing pretty well. And most people are terrible at uh, all of them, so there's a big problem, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So an ideal solution would try to balance, you know, usability, scalability. Um, secure generation of storage, we kind of heard some of that stuff about the HSM module, and you know that's that's really awesome. Um, I think that because we carry mobile devices, um, we can we can sort of get a high level of usability by repurposing them for um, storage and passwords. And sure, you can attack them, but um, but at least you know we can kind of improve the overall state of security by by leveraging them. So my ideal solution is one that um, is scalable in the sense that. Um, I can use it for storage of a lot of different um, passwords and authentication for different websites and services and even my local system, my laptop. Um, that it's portable in the sense that I can bring it with me and it's going to be usable when I want to get to other systems. So if I'm on a random computer that I don't necessarily um, trust, there might be a way to generate a one-time pad um, and use that to authenticate to the system tem temporarily. And of course, secure generation and storage. Well, humans are really bad at generating secure passwords, but it turns out computers, of course, are really good at generating um, basic random random ent entropy. So we can basically use you know high entropy, long passwords all the time if we if we take advantage. Um, and that's pretty much all the those are the dimensions that at least I could think of when I was um, thinking about this problem. I'm curious if anybody has any other dimension that I'm missing. If you want to pitch it in, tell me. Um, but I hope I hope I capture most of those dimensions. So, what are the existing technologies that people use? Um, one password on mobile devices. Uh, LastPass, I guess, is another one. But one password on um, on mobile and and um, desktop systems. Um, Google Auth. How many of you guys are using Google Authentication for second factor? Yeah, I'd say that's pretty popular. Um, Duo Security has their their platform. I'm curious, how many of you guys are using that for? And yeah, cool. Um, RSA Secure ID, you know, most of the big companies that I've worked for in the past um, have used RSA Secure ID. So those are really, um, th those are the main technologies that I see people using it. Another big one that I really like is the YubiKey because it's a dedicated device to store um, static passwords. And, and if, you're, if you're willing to put your password somewhere in a third party system, um, then you can sort of have a central point of management and use the YubiKey to basically, um, as, a, as a single hardware device, to send those passwords to your system. And the really nice thing about YubiKey is that you can use it anywhere, right? It uses the human interface device, um, so it essentially looks like a keyboard when you plug it into any, any system that receives a USB device. So, you know, my thinking here is how can I take advantage of that usability um, and put it on a platform that we already carry with us and still maintain the level of, of scalability that 
um, using something in software gives us. So, you know, software based password manager. So, you already have a smartphone, right? Um, why not let it type the password and let it be 100 UV key in your pockets? I probably I already alluded to this, but that's basically what this is about. Um, the idea here is I took um, an open source um, application on Android, so I do this on an Android device, make some uh, hacks to the, to the Linux Android kernel at a really low level in the platform, um, which kind of is an issue, which I'll get to in a little bit later, but the idea here is to combine this low level modification with um, a user space application and make it so that the phone, when plugged into a, uh, another system, looks like just like a keyboard, like it does with the UV key. So why pick um, keypass droid? Well, it's the first one I asked a few of my friends, and um, it was the first one that came to, uh, came to mind. And it had a pretty good rating for you know, being up on the Google Play Store. It had about 20,000 ratings, so that um, it's open source, has a familiar user interface that people have been using and you know, find um, helpful. And it only uses a local local database, so it's not something that's. Um, so I'm pretty paranoid. I'm not going to store my passwords in the third party um, in the cloud. So I actually like the idea of having a local database, and um, it does still fall fall prey to the issue of having at least one single point of failure. Um, if your device is stolen, of course, I work for a forensic company. I know it's possible to extract um, information from mobile devices, and basically the idea is. Um, you have a local database that's stored with a master key. That master key is derived from a number of, um, I think it's like 6,000 rounds of AES encryption. And um, you guys probably know a lot more. I'm actually a password weenie. Um, but basically, the idea here is, uh, is you know, somebody else figured that stuff out for me, and I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so I used that open source application that already was out there. So Android. Android is great because basically it's designed to do a lot of the things that I wanted it to do. Um, basically, we we already use these um, Android devices for uh, tethering, for doing Ethernet tethering. Um, we plugged our phones in to charge our computers, or to charge the phone, you know, with our other systems. Uh, and of course, there's the existing media transfer protocols. So some of my time was spent understanding these existing protocols and how to sort of hack them to do what I wanted. Um, and so. Android calls this basically, it's a, effectively the next thing um, called gadget mode. And any, any mobile device, any modern mobile device has this USB hardware called on the go that lets it switch roles between being a USB host device and a USB slave device. Our laptops and desktops generally just have the host based hardware, whereas our, our mobile devices tend to have this on the go hardware. Um, so Android accessories, this is what Google tells you it's for. Um, it can be used for audio docking, for interacting with exercise equipment. Um, you know, they have the grand goal of the Android device being the central platform on a robotic system. So, you know, it's very hackable, but unfortunately it's not hackable to the point where I can make, uh, I could very easily add this hidden human interface device to the platform without hacking the kernel itself. So my thought was why not, um, also, why not the laptop or desktop be an accessory to the, the uh, mobile device? So this is kind of how it works conceptually. Um, when you plug in a USB uh, device to your laptop, it, the laptop sends an enumerate command, and the phone basically responds with some um, information, like I'm an MTP device. MTP is basically media transfer protocol that's me transfer pictures from my phone to the, uh, to the laptop. Um, next, we have like something like a, um, a human interface device. So basically, this is the part that I added, right? The phone announces that it's a keyboard. The laptop or desktop loads the corresponding driver for that for that human interface device. So one of the other really nice things about this approach is that any device that supports keyboards essentially supports this this approach to authentication. So then we have the human interface device, and then. Basically, the way that um, USB works is you have uh, eight byte sequences that correspond to it. It's like a lookup table. Um, depending on your your keyboard type, if it's a US based or other country, then they're, they're different mappings. But the basic idea here is just an eight byte um, that represents how many keys are being pressed and also what key is being held down. And so in this case, the OX004 eight bytes is corresponding to A, B, and C. And so when, you're when you want to send these, uh, these keystrokes over the USB interface, you basically just generate these eight byte sequences corresponding to those characters that you want to send over. 
and the other system on the other side interprets them accordingly. And of course, you get your ABC on the other side. So you've already seen a mini demo of how this works. At least I use it to log into my laptop. And here, I'm going to try to give a little bit more of an idea of how this might work um, practically for other people. So let me just switch screens. I'm going to do this in the emulator. Um, but the actual sending of keystrokes won't work in the emulator because there's no actual USB hardware to interact with. And then I'll just basically show you that the same thing works on my mobile device. And just, this is just mainly to give you a feel for the user interface and the experience. That's interesting. Right? It seems to be sending all sorts of weird characters. <laughs> Pointer's offset in the emulator. Yeah, thanks. All right, so you basically would run the app from So when you first start the app, you have to unlock the database. So you basically type in your um, your master password. So in this case, it's just test. And of course, that's where the big issue lies, right? Like, how do we still authenticate with um, our mobile devices? And what I'm thinking of doing here actually is basically to use an NFC tag, um, bring it up close to the mobile device, and use that to unlock my my password database. I'm thinking about this from my personal perspective because. Originally, I was doing this all for my personal use. So I'm sort of sharing this with the rest of the world and I hope that um, other people might find it useful. But um, right now, that is the weakest link and the recovery of the um, information from those databases. So here, you can basically create your own, um, you know, your, your new passwords. And unfortunately, I can't really see the interface well enough to add a new one. So I'm just going to show you one that I already had. So here's one that I pre-populated and basically, you know, totally randomly generated password. I think this one was 120 characters long. Um, so what I'm going to do now is basically bring up a text editor in my in my um, my console system, and I'm going to use the mobile device to send the same 100. Actually, it's going to be a 1,024 character password to my to my system. So I don't know if there are any, thousand, any, any systems that can actually receive 1,024 characters for password, but um, I'd like to see that happen now that, uh, now that we can use this technology. I think you can use it with Hotmail. It just truncates it slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so how many do you actually have? 16. That's too bad. So here we are typing a 1,024 character password. And I'm sure you guys have seen this kind of thing before with like a teensy USB device, so there's nothing really new here, but it's really the, the using the mobile device here is the, is the huge win, I think. It also helps with keystroke timing analysis, too. <laughs> sure. How fast can you inject keys before it drops keys? Um, I haven't actually figured that out yet. So whenever I'm sending a keystroke, I'm actually only sending one keystroke. Um, you can send up to eight at a time, and I'm not sure how, because basically you can send down all eight keys being held down at the same time. So in theory, the bandwidth could be a lot higher than what I'm doing. It's just a question of Google receiving system. When it sees that eight keys are being held down, how will it deal with that, right? But in theory, I can send the fact that eight keys are held down um, with those eight bytes. Um, maybe it's fewer because seven of the bytes, one of the bytes is reserved, so, and one of the devices used for control modifiers like control, shift, and, and all. But in theory, we get pretty high bandwidth from that. Um, obviously, sending 1,024 characters took a, a little bit of time. It wasn't instantaneous. And it's also going to be limited by what the OS accepts, and that's probably what you're getting at. I'm not sure what, they, what the OS will do to drop uh, keystrokes. So, modifications to keep asteroid or open source, um, or will be open source. It really won't do you any good unless you have the actual kernel modifications. So um, basically, it's useless until that actually gets taken by somebody and implemented and put onto other devices. 
the the um, kernel patch ends up being around 200 lines of code, so it's actually pretty small. Something that um, I could probably get Google to um, add if, if we push hard for it. Um, yeah, you so also might have luck with the third-party kernel developers. So like Cyan and Ron would definitely be a good one to, to approach, yep. Um, so yeah, if you guys are running Cyan and Ron into your systems, hopefully I can get this pushed out to them pretty soon. Um, so here, basically we need some kind of um, hit descriptor. So every every keyboard and every, every hardware device has a descriptor that corresponds to um, what uh, what it is. You know what the whether it's a U.S. based device or another another particular um, country. So that's important to get right depending on where you're implementing this. Um, so basically, you can grab these descriptors from any hardware device that you have and use USB Probe on Mac, where you can use LSUSB to grab these descriptors. Um, so the idea here is that I can make my phone look like any arbitrary keyboard. Um, some of the challenges is that this is a patch that's basically being done on a per hardware device, per uh, Android device basis. So I've done this on my Galaxy Nexus. Um, it's not clear to me how this scales, uh, because it requires root, obviously, to be able to put this on your platform. Um, and so I'm not sure how that would scale to other devices. That was part of the reason why I kept it mostly for personal use. But um, I'm hoping that maybe somebody here could put, put me in touch with the right people. Signage mod sounds like a great way to do it, so actually I hadn't thought about that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of third-party kernels for all the various devices, and I think it would be very easy to get some of the developers to add these patches, and then people who are running custom kernels could just upgrade to one of these kernels. Um, it, it should be fairly easy. I actually know a few of the kernel developers, awesome. so ping me later. All right. Ping, ping um, me later as well. So um, I'm hopeful because uh, Linaro, which is an open source um, Linux guys, basically they're they're pushing really hard to move some of this um, low level kernel stuff actually to user space. So it's possible that in the future these Android devices will implement that uh, media transfer protocol and those other low level uh, protocols into you push into user space. So in theory, um, we won't need root, we might need root, but we won't need a kernel patch to do some of these things. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in whether or not that'll help this situation out. Of course, this whole approach is not as secure as de a, a dedicated hardware. I know from a, from a forensic point of view that the device can be compromised and, um, and the data can be recovered. Um, I'm, I'm sort of sorry that I don't have a whole lot of, of background on, on how to generate really strong passwords. That's not really my area of expertise. I'm kind of hoping to just sort of share this, um, this ability to do with the, the whole system the, you know, to you guys. Some of the things that I'd like to do in the future, this is where I'm really open to new ideas, is basically, you know, could I take a snapshot with my phone of a QR code on a web service and use that to see um, my password generation or my next password? Um, and I think that there's a lot of really cool ideas that could come out of using a more sensor-rich platform like a mobile device um, to help, you know, this whole password situation. Uh, I really think that if everybody started using this kind of technology, it would be a lot harder to crack passwords on the back end. Um, so I think Andre really wanted this to get out there because it's kind of a disruptive technology if it were actually take, to actually take off. If you take out of the hands the, the need to generate passwords um, from the human and give them a tool that'll work on a, you know, on a more, usable, in a more usable way, then maybe those challenges, all those uh, tables that you guys have generated will be almost useless, I guess. So maybe it'll make your jobs harder, I don't know. But um, still, we have that problem, I guess, of authenticating to the mobile device. Um, I'm thinking about releasing also the, a sort of like a, an API to, uh, maybe there are other ideas that people could come up with with using, you know, having a phone be able to type arbitrary things. So I don't know, so this has a limit on that. Uh, obviously, this is just a proof of concept. Uh, my company has no real, I don't think any plans right now to commercialize any of this, but um, basically, you know, we're hoping that somebody can actually build this as a real tool. So um, that's it. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay. Have you looked into doing this via Bluetooth at all? Um, yes, a little bit, and it's not that hard. Actually, the, it's just sort of a usability uh, usability issue. Like, am I going to pair all the time, or do I just set up a single pairing? Um, Bluetooth is obviously vulnerable to some, you know, man in the attacks with, with um, you know, capturing wireless. But yeah, I definitely have a, another proof of concept that does it with Bluetooth. Um, so I like the idea of being able to walk up to any other system 
just plug in and use it, right? Bluetooth, I have to still go through that pairing process, and I'm not sure how it works with, so I can, I can currently use this one as soon as my laptop boots up, so I can use it to decrypt my whole system. I'm not sure how that works with, um, uh, with platforms where I haven't previously authenticated with Bluetooth. Sure. Yeah, but that's definitely another nice way to go. Just a lazy question. Is yeah. That, is there, uh, what is key patch going to use to, as it's like local encrypted storage? Um, so I believe they use the AS256, um, and it generates that password with, it generates that master key after 6,000 rounds of basically taking your, your password um, with a salt and goes through the 6,000 rounds. I think it does a SHA-256 on that and then uses that as the, um, um, uses that to unlock the password, or to unlock the rest of the database. But yeah, I'm not an expert on that stuff, so I'm not really sure. You could easily dive into the code so it's open source. Yeah, so it's looking at Yeah, sure. Anybody else up in the back? Yeah, I think you talked about a problem being authenticating to your um, mobile device like your Android. And I'm wondering if there's any um, capacity in Android to act as a biometric sensor. So if you just put your thumbprint on the glass and kind of do a thumbprint or you know, eye for every scan possibly as another method of keeping a lot of your goals. Absolutely. I think that, so that, yeah, that's an interesting comment. I mean, because we're using the sensor-rich platform, there's all sorts of different ways to capture information about the user. Why not use that basically to authenticate the user to the device? Yeah, definitely, it sounds good. Sure, go ahead. So I, I noticed in your really long random password, uh, the slide, or when you were showing the, uh, the demo, this one? Or? Uh, well, it was the one that was actually displayed on your device. I guess it was in the middle of your uh, password that it actually showed. Yeah, the U7, U less than. Um, I thought the fourth character in your password was actually less than. Um, if it was, there's uh, this one um, CS, uh, CMS that truncates at the first less than sign. Uh -huh. So it would be three characters. <laughs> well, so this password. I just thought it was funny. Like, yeah, that was, funny. I was like, oh. <laughs> that but it's funny. actually longer. Yeah. So obviously, we can um, we can customize the generation of those passwords. That's not really something that I did a whole lot of on KeyPass, right? But um, I think that maybe this increases usability of the app, and so maybe people improve the state of it. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I've implemented something like that in Harvard. Uh, and on mine, I implemented two-factor authentication. Have you thought about doing the same, like Google Authenticator and UP built into the, the app itself to be able to generate the, the one-time password uh, rather yeah. than like opening up Google Authenticator app? And, and, and right. And yeah, so that definitely seems like something that we could do. Um, there's no Google Authenticator. Well, maybe there is for Android. It probably is. Yeah. Um, then if it's open source or hackable, we could probably have it added in when we get it. Yeah, definitely, thanks. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, just two things. Uh, Sorry. About Google Authenticator, you uh, had mentioned scanning a, uh, you know, just scanning the code and using that to see. Yeah. And that's, what, that's exactly what Google Authenticator does. Right. And so that code is all. Oh, so I can just reuse that? Is yeah. What you're saying. Yeah, up there. And of course, you know, just to say, this of course could be. Your technique could be used with any password manager. Right. So if there are any Google people out there, just add this in. Yeah. All right, cool, thanks. Okay, well.